Found in Earth By Isaac Asimov Audiobook 23 of 27 I remember what she looked like. For a few moments, bliss dissolved dissolved in laughter. Then she said, Yet I don't think Hiroko held you helpless in her mighty grip, or inflicted her irresistible will on your cringing body. Of course not. I was perfectly willing. But it was her suggestion, just the same. Polorit said, with just a tinge of envy in his voice, Does this happen to you all the time, Golan? Of course it must, Pell, said Bliss. Women are helplessly drawn to him. I wish that were so, said Trevise, but it isn't. And I'm glad it isn't I do have other things I want to do in life. Just the same, in this case I was irresistible. After all, we were the first people from another world that Hiroko had ever seen or, apparently, that anyone now alive on Alpha had ever seen. I gathered from things she let slip, casual remarks, that she had the rather exciting notion that I might be different from Alphans either anatomically or in my technique. Poor thing. I'm afraid she was disappointed. Oh. Said Bliss. Were you? No, said Trevise. I have been on a number of worlds and I have had my experiences. And what I had discovered is that people are people and sex is sex, wherever one goes. If there are noticeable differences, they are usually both trivial and unpleasant. The perfumes I've encountered in my time. I remember when a young woman simply couldn't manage unless there was music loudly played, music that consisted of a desperate screeching sound. So she played the music and then I couldn't manage. I assure you if it's the same old thing, then I'm satisfied. Speaking of music, said Bliss, we are invited to a musicale after dinner. A very formal thing, apparently, that is being held in our honor. I gather the Alphans are very proud of their music. Trevise grew maced. Their pride will in no way make the music sound better to our ears. Hear me out, said Bliss. I gather that their pride is that they play expertly on very archaic instruments. Very archaic. We may get some information about Earth by way of them. Trevise's eyebrows shot up. An interesting thought. And that reminds me that both of you may already have information. Janov, did you see this monolith that Hiroko told us about? Indeed I did, said Polorit. I was with him for three hours and Hiroko did not exaggerate. It was a virtual monologue on his part and when I left to come to lunch. He clung to me and would not let me go until I promised to return whenever I could in order that I might listen to him some more. And did he say anything of interest? Well, he, too like everybody else insisted that Earth was thoroughly and murderously radioactive, that the ancestors of the Alphans were the last to leave and that if they hadn't, they would have died. And, Golan, he was so emphatic that I couldn't help believing him. I'm convinced that Earth is dead, and that our entire search is, after all, useless. 79. Trevis sat back in his chair, staring at Polorit, who was sitting on a narrow cot. Bliss, having risen from where she had been sitting next to Polorit, looked from one to the other. Finally, Trevis said, let me be the judge as to whether our search is useless or not, Janov. Tell me what the garrulous old man had to say to you in brief, of course. Polorit said, I took notes as Mona Lee spoke. It helped reinforce my role as scholar, but I don't have to refer to them. He was quite stream of consciousness in his speaking. Each thing he said would remind him of something else, but, of course, I have spent my life trying to organize information in the search of the relevant and significant so that it's second nature for me now to be able to condense a long and incoherent discourse Trevise said gently, into something just as long and incoherent? To the point, dear Janov. Polorit cleared his throat uneasily. 
Yes, certainly, old chap. I-11 try to make a connected and chronological tale out of it. Earth was the original home of humanity and of millions of species of plants and animals. It continued so for countless years until hyperspatial travel was invented. Then the spacer worlds were founded. They broke away from Earth, developed their own cultures, and came to despise and oppress the mother planet. After a couple of centuries of this, Earth managed to regain its freedom, though Mona Lee did not explain the exact manner in which this was done, and I dared not ask questions, even if he had given me a chance to interrupt, which he did not, for that might merely have sent him into new byways. He did mention a culture hero named Elijah Bailey, but the references were so characteristic of the habit of attributing to one figure the accomplishments of generations that there was little value in attempting to bliss said, Yes, pal dear, we understand that part. Again, Pelorid paused in midstream and reconsidered. Of course. My apologies. Earth initiated a second wave of settlements, founding many new worlds in a new fashion. The new group of settlers proved more vigorous than the spacers, outpaced them, defeated them, outlasted them, and, eventually, established the Galactic Empire. During the course of the wars between the settlers and the spacers no, not wars, for he used the word conflict, being very careful about that the Earth became radioactive. Trevis said, with clear annoyance, that's ridiculous, Janov. How can a world become radioactive? Every world is very slightly radioactive to one degree or another from the moment of formation, and that radioactivity slowly decays. It doesn't become radioactive. Pelorid shrugged. I'm only telling you what he said. And he was only telling me what he had heard from someone who only told him what he had heard and so on. It's folk history told and retold over the generations, with who knows what distortions creeping in at each retelling. I understand that, but are there no books, documents, ancient histories which have frozen the story at an early time and which could give us something more accurate than the present tale? Actually, I managed to ask that question, and the answer is no. He said vaguely that there were books about it in ancient times and that they had long ago been lost but that what he was telling us was what had been in those books. Yes, well distorted. It's the same story. In every world we go to, the records of Earth have, in one way or another, disappeared. Well, how did he say the radioactivity began on Earth? He didn't, in any detail. The closest he came to saying so was that the spacers were responsible, but then I gathered that the spacers were the demons on whom the people of Earth blamed all misfortune. The radioactivity a clear voice overrode him here. Bliss, am I a spacer? Falom was standing in the narrow doorway between the two rooms, hair tousled and the nightgown she was wearing, designed to fit Bliss's more ample proportions, having slid off one shoulder to reveal an undeveloped breast. Bliss said, we worry about eavesdroppers outside and we forget the one inside. Now, Falom, why do you say that? She rose and walked toward the youngster. Falom said, I don't have what they have, she pointed at the two men, or what you have, Bliss. I'm different. Is that because I'm a spacer? You are, Falom, said Bliss soothingly, but little differences don't matter. Come back to bed. Falom became submissive as she always did when Bliss willed her to be so. She turned and said, Am I a demon? What is a demon? Bliss said over her shoulder, Wait one moment for me. I'll be right back. She was, within five minutes. She was shaking her head. She'll be sleeping now till I wake her. I should have done that before. I suppose, but any modification of the mind must be the result of necessity. She added defensively, I can't have her brood on the differences between her genital equipment and ours. 
Halorit said, Someday she'll have to know she's hermaphroditic. Someday, said Bliss, but not now. Go on with the story, pal. Yes, said Trevis, before something else interrupts us. Well, Earth became radioactive, or at least its crust did. At that time, Earth had had an enormous population that was centered in huge cities that existed for the most part underground now, that, put in Trevise, is surely not so. It must be local patriotism glorifying the golden age of a planet, and the details were simply a distortion of Trantor in its golden age, when it was the imperial capital of a galaxy-wide system of worlds. Polorid paused, then said, Really, Golan? You mustn't teach me my business. We mythologists know very well that myths and legends contain borrowings, moral lessons, nature cycles, and a hundred other distorting influences, and we labor to cut them away and get to what might be a kernel of truth. In fact, these same techniques must be applied to the most sober histories, for no one writes the clear and apparent truth if such a thing can even be said to exist. For now, I'm telling you more or less what Mona Lee told me, though I suppose I am adding distortions of my own, try as I might not to do so. Well, well, said Trevise. Go on, Janov. I meant no offense. And I've taken none. The huge cities, assuming they existed, crumbled and shrank as the radioactivity slowly grew more intense until the population was but a remnant of what it had been, clinging precariously to regions that were relatively radiation-free. The population was kept down by rigid birth control and by the euthanasia of people over 60. Horrible, said Bliss indignantly. Undoubtedly, said Polorit, but that is what they did, according to Mona Lee and that might be true, for it is certainly not complimentary to the Earth people and it is not likely that an uncomplimentary lie would be made up. The Earth people, having been despised and oppressed by the Spacers, were now despised and oppressed by the Empire, though here we may have exaggeration there out of self-pity, which is a very seductive emotion. There is the case yes, yes, Polorit, another time. Please go on with Earth. I beg your pardon. The Empire, in a fit of benevolence, agreed to substitute imported radiation-free soil and to cart away the contaminated soil. Needless to say, that was an enormous task which the Empire soon tired of, especially as this period, if my guess is right, coincided with the fall of Kandarvi, after which the Empire had many more things to worry about than Earth. The radioactivity continued to grow more intense, the population continued to fall, and finally the Empire, in another fit of benevolence, offered to transplant the remnant of the population to a new world of their own to this world, in short. At an earlier period, it seems an expedition had stocked the oceans so that by the time the plans for the transplantation of Earth people were being developed, there was a full oxygen atmosphere and an ample supply of food on Alpha. Nor did any of the worlds of the Galactic Empire covet this world because there is a certain natural antipathy to planets that circle stars of a binary system. There are so few suitable planets in such a system, I suppose, that even suitable ones are rejected because of the assumption that there must be something wrong with them. This is a common thought fashion. There is the well-known case, for instance, of later with the well-known case, Janov, said Trevis. On with the transplantation. What remained, said Polorit, hurrying his words a little, was to prepare a land base. The shallowest part of the ocean was found and sediment was raised from deeper parts to add to the shallow sea bottom and, finally, to produce the island of New Earth. Boulders and coral were dredged up and added to the island. Land plants were seeded so that root systems might help make the new land firm. Again, the empire had set itself an enormous task. Perhaps continents were planned at first, but by the time this one island was produced, the empire's moment of benevolence had passed. 
what was left of Earth's population was brought here. The Empire's fleets carried off its men and machinery, and they never returned. The Earth people, living on New Earth, found themselves in complete isolation. Trevise said, Complete? Did Monali say that no one from elsewhere in the galaxy has ever come here till we did? Almost complete, said Pelorit. There is nothing to come here for, I suppose, even if we set aside the superstitious distaste for binary systems. Occasionally, at long intervals, a ship would come, as ours did, but it would eventually leave and there has never been a follow-up. And that's it. Trevise said, did you ask Mona Lee where Earth was located? Of course I asked that. He didn't know. How can he know so much about Earth's history without knowing where it is located? I asked him specifically, Golan, if the star that was only a parsec or so distant from Alpha might be the sun about which Earth revolved. He didn't know what a parsec was, and I said it was a short distance, astronomically speaking. He said, short or long, he did not know where Earth was located and he didn't know anyone who knew, and, in his opinion, it was wrong to try to find it. It should be allowed, he said, to move endlessly through space in peace. Trevise said, do you agree with him? Polorid shook his head sorrowfully. Not really. But he said that at the rate the radioactivity continued to increase, the planet must have become totally uninhabitable not long after the transplantation took place and that by now it must be burning intensely so that no one can approach. Nonsense, said Trevise firmly. A planet cannot become radioactive and, having done so, continuously increase in radioactivity. Radioactivity can only decrease. But Mona Lee is so sure of it. So many people we've talked to on various worlds unite in this that Earth is radioactive. Surely, it is useless to go on. 80. Trevis drew a deep breath, then said, in a carefully controlled voice, Nonsense, Janov. That's not true. Polorit said, Well, now, old chap, you mustn't believe something just because you want to believe it. My wants have nothing to do with it. In world after world we find all records of Earth wiped out. Why should they be? Wiped out if there is nothing to hide, if Earth is a dead, radioactive world that cannot be approached. I don't know, Golan. Yes, you do. When we were approaching Melpomania, you said that the radioactivity might be the other side of the coin. Destroy records to remove accurate information, supply the tale of radioactivity to insert inaccurate information. Both would discourage any attempt to find Earth, and we mustn't be deluded into discouragement. Bliss said, actually, you seem to think the nearby star is Earth's sun. Why, then, continue to argue the question of radioactivity? What does it matter? Why not simply go to the nearby star and see if it is Earth, and, if so, what it is like? Trevise said, because those on Earth must be, in their way, extraordinarily powerful, and I would prefer to approach with some knowledge of the world and its inhabitants. As it is, since I continue to remain ignorant of Earth, approaching it is dangerous. It is my notion that I leave the rest of you here on Alpha and that I proceed to Earth by myself. One life is quite enough to risk. No, Golan, said Polorit earnestly. Bliss and the child might wait here, but I must go with you. I have been searching for Earth since before you were born and I cannot stay behind when the goal is so close, whatever dangers might threaten. Bliss and the child will not wait here said Bliss. I am Gaia, and Gaia can protect us even against Earth. I hope you're right, said Trevise gloomily, but Gaia could not prevent the elimination of all early memories of Earth's role in its founding. That was done in Gaia's early history when it was not yet well organized, not yet advanced. Matters are different now. 
I hope that is so. Or is it that you have gained information about Earth this morning that we don't have? I did ask that you speak to some of the older women that might be available here. And so I did. Trevi said, and what did you find out? Nothing about Earth. There is a total blank there. Ah. But they are advanced biotechnologists. Oh. On this small island, they have grown and tested innumerable strains of plants and animals and designed a suitable ecological balance, stable and self. Supporting, despite the few species with which they began. They have improved on the ocean life that they found when they arrived here a few thousand years ago, increasing their nutritive value and improving their taste. It is their biotechnology that has made this world such a cornucopia of plenty. They have plans for themselves, too. What kind of plans? Bliss said, they know perfectly well they cannot reasonably expect to expand their range under present circumstances, confined as they are to the one small patch of land that exists on their world, but they dream of becoming amphibious. Of becoming what? Amphibious. They plan to develop gills in addition to lungs. They dream of being able to spend substantial periods of time underwater, of finding shallow regions and building structures on the ocean bottom. My informant was quite glowing about it but she admitted that this had been a goal of the Alphans for some centuries now and that little, if any, progress has been made. Trevi said, that's two fields in which they might be more advanced than we are weather control and biotechnology. I wonder what their techniques are. We'd have to find specialists, said Bliss, and they might not be willing to talk about it. Trevi said, it's not our primary concern here, but it would clearly pay the foundation to attempt to learn from this miniature world. Polorit said, we manage to control the weather fairly well on Terminus, as it is. Control is good on many worlds, said Trevise, but always it's a matter of the world as a whole. Here the Alphans control the weather of a small portion of the world and they must have techniques we don't have. Anything else, Bliss? Social invitations. These appear to be a holiday-making people, in whatever time they can take from farming and fishing. After dinner, tonight there'll be a music festival. I told you about that already. Tomorrow, during the day, there will be a beach festival. Apparently, all around the rim of the island there will be a congregation of everyone who can get away from the fields in order that they might enjoy the water and celebrate the sun, since it will be raining the next day. In the morning, the fishing fleet will come back, beating the rain, and by evening there will be a food festival, sampling the catch. Polorit groaned. The meals are ample enough as it is. What would a food festival be like? I gather that it will feature not quantity, but variety. In any case, all four of us are invited to participate in all the festivals, especially the music festival tonight. On the antique instruments? Asked Trevise. That's right. What makes them antique, by the way? Primitive computers. No, no. That's the point. It isn't electronic music at all, but mechanical. They described it to me. They scrape strings, blow in tubes, and bang on surfaces. I hope you're making that up, said Trevis, appalled. No, I'm not. And I understand that your Hiraka will be blowing on one of the tubes I forget its name and you ought to be able to endure that. As for myself, said Polorit, I would love to go. I know very little about primitive music and I would like to hear it. She is not my Hiraka, said Trevise coldly. But are the instruments of the type once used on Earth, do you suppose? So I gathered, said Bliss. At least the Alphan women said they were designed long before their ancestors came here. In that case, said Trevise, it may be worth listening to all that scraping, tootling, and banging, 
for whatever information it might conceivably yield concerning Earth. 81. Oddly enough, it was Falom who was most excited at the prospect of a musical evening. She and Bliss had bathed in the small outhouse behind their quarters. It had a bath with running water, hot and cold, or, rather, warm and cool, a washbowl, and a commode. It was totally clean and usable and, in the late afternoon sun, it was even well lit and cheerful. As always, Falom was fascinated with Bliss's breasts and Bliss was reduced to saying, now that Falom understood Galactic, that on her world that was the way people were. To which Falom said, inevitably, why? And Bliss, after some thought, deciding there was no sensible way of answering, returned the universal reply, because. When they were done, Bliss helped Falom put on the undergarment supplied them by the Alphans and worked out the system whereby the skirt went on over it. Leaving Falom unclothed from the waist up seemed reasonable enough. She herself, while making use of Alphan garments below the waist, rather tight about the hips, put on her own blouse. It seemed silly to be too inhibited to expose breasts in a society where all women did, especially since her own were not large and were as shapely as any she had seen but there it was. The two men took their turn at the outhouse next, Trevise muttering the usual male complaint concerning the time the women had taken. Bliss turned Falom about to make sure the skirt would hold in place over her boyish hips and buttocks. She said, It's a very pretty skirt. Falom. Do you like it? Falom stared at it in a mirror and said, Yes, I do. Won't I be cold with nothing on, though? And she ran her hands down her bare chest. I don't think so, Falom. It's quite warm on this world. You have something on. Yes, I do. That's how it is on my world. Now, Falom. We're going to be with a great many Alphans during dinner and afterward. Do you think you can bear that? Falom looked distressed, and Bliss went on, I will sit on your right side and I will hold you. Pell will sit on the other side, and Trevise will sit across the table from you. We won't let anyone talk to you, and you won't have to talk to anyone. I'll try, Bliss, Falom piped in her highest tones. Then afterward, said Bliss, some Alphans will make music for us in their own special way. Do you know what music is? She hummed in the best imitation of electronic harmony that she could. Falom's face lit up. You mean the last word was in her own language, and she burst into song. Bliss's eyes widened. It was a beautiful tune, even though it was wild, and rich in trills. That's right. Music, she said. Falom said excitedly, Jembi made she hesitated, then decided to use the galactic word music all the time. It made music on A again a word in her own language. Bliss repeated the word doubtfully, on a fifal. Falom laughed. Not fifal, with both words juxtaposed like that, Bliss could hear the difference but she despaired of reproducing the second. She said, What does it look like? Falom's as yet limited vocabulary in Galactic did not suffice for an accurate description, and her gestures did not produce any shape clearly in Bliss's mind. He showed me how to use the Falom said proudly. I used my fingers just the way Jembi did, but it said that soon I wouldn't have to. That's wonderful, dear said Bliss. After dinner, we'll see if the Alphans are as good as your Jembi was. Falom's eyes sparkled and pleasant thoughts of what was to follow carried her through a lavish dinner despite the crowds and laughter and noise all about her. Only once, when a dish was accidentally upset, setting off shrieks of excitement fairly close to them, did Falom look frightened, and Bliss promptly held her clothes in a warm and protective hug. I wonder if we can arrange to eat by ourselves, she muttered to Pelorit. Otherwise, we'll have to get off this world. 
It's bad enough eating all this isolate animal protein, but I must be able to do it in peace. It's only high spirits, said Pelorit, who would have endured anything within reason that he felt came under the heading of primitive behavior and beliefs. And then the dinner was over, and the announcement came that the music festival would soon begin. 82. The hall in which the music festival was to be held was about as large as the dining room, and there were folding seats, rather uncomfortable, Travis found out, for about a hundred fifty people. As honored guests, the visitors were led to the front row, and various alphans commented politely and favorably on their clothes. Both men were bare above the waist and Travis tightened his abdominal muscles whenever he thought of it and stared down, on occasion, with complacent self-admiration at his dark-haired chest. Pelorit, in his ardent observation of everything about him, was indifferent to his own appearance. Bliss's blouse drew covered stares of puzzlement but nothing was said concerning it. Trevise noted that the hall was only about half full and that the large majority of the audience were women, since, presumably, so many men were out to see. Pelorid nudged Trevise and whispered, they have electricity. Trevise looked at the vertical tubes on the walls, and at others on the ceiling. They were softly luminous. Fluorescence, he said. Quite primitive. Yes but they do the job, and we've got those things in our rooms and in the outhouse. I thought they were just decorative. If we can find out how to work them, we won't have to stay in the dark. Bliss said irritably, they might have told us. Pelorit said, they thought we'd know, that anyone would know. Four women now emerged from behind screens and seated themselves in a group in the space at the front. Each held an instrument of varnished wood of a similar shape, but one that was not easily describable. The instruments were chiefly different in size. One was quite small, two somewhat larger, and the fourth considerably larger. Each woman also held a long rod in the other hand. The audience whistled softly as they came in, in response to which the four women bowed. Each had a strip of gauze bound fairly tightly across the breasts as though to keep them from interfering with the instrument. Trevise, interpreting the whistles as signs of approval, or of pleased anticipation, felt it only polite to add his own. At that, Falom added a trill that was far more than a whistle and that was beginning to attract attention when pressure from Bliss's hand stopped her. Three of the women, without preparation, put their instruments under their chins, while the largest of the instruments remained between the legs of the fourth woman and rested on the floor. The long rod in the right hand of each was sawed across the strings stretching nearly the length of the instrument, while the fingers of the left hand shifted rapidly along the upper ends of those strings. This, thought Trevise, was the scraping he had expected, but it didn't sound like scraping at all. There was a soft and melodious succession of notes, each instrument doing something of its own and the whole fusing pleasantly. It lacked the infinite complexity of electronic music, real music, as Travis could not help but think of it, and there was a distinct sameness to it. Still, as time passed, and his ear grew accustomed to this odd system of sound, he began to pick out subtleties. It was wearisome to have to do so and he thought, longingly, of the clamor and mathematical precision and purity of the real thing, but it occurred to him that if he listened to the music of these simple wooden devices long enough he might well grow to like it. It was not till the concert was some forty-five minutes old that Hiroko stepped out. She noticed Trevis in the front row at once and smiled at him. He joined the audience in the soft whistle of approval with a whole heart. She looked beautiful in a long and most elaborate skirt, a large flower in her hair, and nothing at all over her breasts since, apparently, there was no danger of their interference with the instrument. Her instrument proved to be a dark wooden tube about two-thirds of a meter long and nearly two centimeters thick. She lifted the instrument to her lips and blew across an opening near one end, producing a thin, 
sweet note that wavered in pitch as her fingers manipulated metal objects along the length of the tube. At the first sound, Falom clutched at Bliss's arm and said, Bliss, that's a and the word sounded like feeful to Bliss. Bliss shook her head firmly at Falom, who said, in a lower voice, but it is. Others were looking in Falom's direction. Bliss put her hand firmly over Falom's mouth, and leaned down to mutter an almost subliminally forceful quiet. Into her ear. Falom listened to Hiroko's playing quietly thereafter, but her fingers moved spasmodically, as though they were operating the objects along the length of the instrument. The final player in the concert was an elderly man who had an instrument with fluted sides suspended over his shoulders. He pulled it in and out while one hand flashed across a succession of white and dark objects at one end, pressing them down in groups. Trevis found this sound particularly wearing, rather barbaric, and unpleasantly like the memory of the barking of the dogs on Aurora not that the sound was like barking, but the emotions it gave rise to were similar. Bliss looked as though she would like to place her hands over her ears, and Pelorid had a frown on his face. Only Falom seemed to enjoy it, for she was tapping her foot lightly, and Trevis, when he noticed that, realized, to his own surprise, that there was a beat to the music that matched Falom's footfall. It came to an end at last and there was a perfect storm of whistling, with Falom's trill clearly heard above it all. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.